Thanks very much. Great to be back here. I, I feel like I'm back with family. Uh, Dorothy was at the uh, hearing at the in Olympia when uh, Linda had invited me to join in testifying at a hearing, and uh, you had some great state legislators. Eric Olmig was the sponsor. I know there were others who were supporting at the time a resolution for the impeachment of George Bush, and I believe Dick Cheney was uh, included. It certainly was included in our comments. Um, but that really is an example, I think, for all of us. And it's something that I uh, addressed a lot when I was mayor. People would say, well, first of all, they'd say, you're from Salt Lake City. They elected you in Salt Lake City. But I'd call mayors from around the country. I mean, I'd call the mayor of Berkeley, for heaven's sakes, or Madison, Wisconsin. Where could it be more safe? And I kept hearing from people over and over and over again the same kinds of things that I know you all hear during these tragic times in our nation's history. And that is people say, well, you know, it might hurt me at my job, or it's not really my business, or it's too difficult, or well, it, we can't achieve it anyway, so why should we try? And it's gotten to the point where people start pigeonholing themselves and their lives in these tiny little spots, and they say, I'm not going to go outside of that. So all of a sudden, nobody's standing up. We see so few people that are standing up against the undermining of our republic, the undermining of, of the values upon which this nation was based from the very beginning, the, the, and not that we haven't failed at times to live up to those promises, but at least there was the promise. At least people aspired for us to fulfill those promises. And I know I'm, I'm talking to the wrong people because you wouldn't be here tonight. You're the ones that are out there fighting. You're the ones standing up. But we need to get over this idea that we can't do it, that it's too difficult, that things will never change. I hear a lot from people in the Occupy movement that we've given up on the electoral system. We can't give up on anything. We've got to fight outside the electoral system because that's the only way social progress has really come about previously. In the civil rights movement, the labor movement, the women's suffrage movement, the anti-slavery movement, the anti-war movement. But it also took people who were in elective office who sometimes were pushed but they got the job done in that arena as well. We need to fight on every single front, and it's every one of our jobs. It's not only our responsibility, but a great opportunity that we all have. So, when you think about what it is that drives us, there really are some fundamental common values. And I know there are more than this, but when you keep in mind the values of freedom, equal opportunity, security, and that doesn't just mean national security as we so often hear about, but our own security, familial security, community security, and compassion. And it's those values that really were at the forefront of what the founders had in mind. It's at the core of what has been the promise in this nation from the very beginning. And until the last 12 years, it seemed to be what people in this country uniformly aspired for. Again, we failed at times, but we aspired to get things back on track. And yet these past 12 years, think about it, freedom? 
how our freedoms have been so unbelievably undermined and the respect for freedom of people around the world. And I'll get to more of that in specifically. But with so few people standing up and saying, we're not going to tolerate the undermining of these freedoms. Equal opportunity. The notion of equality, it was there in the Declaration of Independence, it was there in the Constitution, is there in the Constitution. The whole notion that we are one people and that everyone would have equal opportunity for life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And yet, that promise has been stripped away in such fundamental respects under both the Bush and the Obama administrations. Security. All of us are so less secure economically, in our communities, and internationally. Are we safer to travel around the world today than we were 12 years ago? Or have we created so much more hatred and hostility throughout the world, such a lack of respect, when people, you know, it's amazing when you hear the, the, this belligerent talk about Iran and the, the willingness that so many people have to attack Iran because they have bad leaders, as if we haven't had bad leaders. But right after the attacks on this country, on September 11th, 2001, 100,000 people or more came together in Tehran at a candlelight vigil to show and communicate their sympathy and sense of solidarity with the people of the United States. And after the last presidential election in Iran, there were people in the United States who came together after the violence by the Iranian government against their own people. And people in this country stood at candlelight vigils, communicating the same sentiments of solidarity and sympathy with the Iranian people. So we need to make it clear, as people of our nation, we still stand in solidarity. We're still there with the people of Iran, and we will do everything that we can, instead of continuing to undermine the security of the entire world, and especially for the United States and the future of our country, we will continue to stand in solidarity with the people of Iran and do everything we can to prevent any military attack against that country. And then the fourth value of which I spoke, that is compassion. Compassion seems to be a value that's been completely ignored not only by the neoconservatives that only seek economic and military domination around the world, regardless of the tragedy that befalls not only people in other countries, but many who are called to serve in the name of our nation. But compassion seems to be so lacking in our nation's dialogue and our public policies. Everything from having the highest incarceration rate by far in the entire world. Talking about taking away the safety net for so many people, violating the promise that our nation has made for decades under programs like Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. And then, of course, turning a blind eye to the 50 million people who currently have no essential health care coverage. And even under the Obama plan, 
there would be 23 million people without basic health care coverage. We've become a nation where we have more new baby deaths than any other developed nation except for Latvia. And the same thing holds true, basically true for maternal mortality, women dying in childbirth, falling far behind almost the entire rest of the industrialized world. And it's because of one thing, lack of health care coverage for millions and millions of people in this country. And then, this doesn't happen anywhere else in the industrialized world. Nobody takes out bankruptcy because of high medical bills in any other nation in the developed world. 700,000 bankruptcies in the United States every year because of high medical bills. And that's not just people who don't have health care coverage, it's people who don't have sufficient health care coverage. Where is the compassion? That value that has been an, an, an underlying value to so much that our nation has endeavored to do from the very beginning. I mean, consider the first sentence of the United States Constitution, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, that is peace, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Those were the promises upon which this nation was founded. Those are the promises to which we have aspired until it seems the last dozen years. It breaks my heart to think of young people who have come of age in these last 10 or 12 years. The nation that the rest of us grew up in is a freedom-loving country. Sometimes we didn't live up to that, but we aspired to it. It was a nation that believed in civil and human rights. We were always so proud to distinguish ourselves from those tyrannical governments that went around kidnapping, disappearing, and torturing people, or putting their own citizens on assassination lists, or going out and rounding up their own people and indefinitely detaining them without charges, without trial, without legal assistance, without habeas corpus, and yet that is now what we've become. So this is a nation that our young people are growing up in. From the time of George Washington until George Bush, our nation never, as a matter of official policy, ever tolerated torture. We helped lead the way for the Geneva Conventions, the Convention Against Torture, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, all of which absolutely without exception, without any justification accepted, prohibited torture and require, and this is what's being violated every single day by the Obama administration, the Convention Against Torture, and Ronald Reagan made this clear when the convention was ratified by the United States Senate. He made it clear that this covenant requires every signatory nation to prosecute those responsible for torture 
as that nation prosecutes any other serious offenses. And then, of course, we have our own domestic law, the War Crimes Act of 1996, the federal anti-torture statute. So President Bush, in the spirit of Richard M. Nixon, who said during David Frost interview, after he was forced out of office, Richard Nixon said, well, when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. That's the very definition of tyranny. That's a dictatorship. When the president gets to decide that he or she is above the law. And yet that's exactly what George Bush said over and over and over again for eight years in this country and about all we could muster was having a few demonstrations, one state considering an impeachment resolution, but we stood by and allowed these atrocities to occur. We allowed a president to say that his hands aren't tied by legislation by Congress. They're not even tied by the Constitution because according to him, he was the head of the unitary executive branch of government, this, this cockamamie theory that he gets to call the shots regardless of what the Constitution or Congress's laws say. So what brings us to this point tonight? Well, let me tell you, Linda asked me to explain what it is that brought me to this point. When I was a young man, I didn't know quite what I was gonna do. I hitchhiked to San Francisco and there was an Amnesty International event held for the widow of Victor uh, Yara. He was a folk singer who was rounded up after the uh, coup in Chile, which the United States helped organize and was rounded up, tortured, and killed. And I saw at that point, people can come together. We can bring about change if we stand up against these kinds of abuses, make certain that that once they've happened, we can stand up against them and make certain they don't happen again, but it takes a sustained effort to do that. So I decided to go to law school. I believed in the rule of law. I believed in our Constitution and the values underlying it. Got out of law school, and I can tell you it was one of the most uplifting, amazing experiences. When I would represent people who on the outside had little or no power, the disenfranchised, the forgotten, incarcerated people who suffered abuse while they were incarcerated, whose medical, serious medical problems, life-threatening medical problems were ignored, or a young gay man who was abused by police officers, and the police officers show up in court with their three-piece suits on, and it was the most amazing thing, this enormous imbalance of power on the outside, and you walk into a courtroom under Lady Justice, and you see that those scales really are balanced because now they're both on an equal footing before the law. And these folks have to be held to account to somebody who on the outside had no power, but now has all the power imaginable to call them to account. At least when you had a judge who understood his or her role in the courtroom. So I've always believed, not just in these principles as ideals, I believed in what they bring to our lives, the protections how people that, whose rights are violated, not only by government officials, but by corporations, that they, they can take on these powerful interests and the rule of law 
will be applied. It was a beautiful thing. I'll never forget these three police officers in their three-piece suits and my young gay client who was abused at their hands. In federal court, the judge calling them to account and then ripping into them for their abuses of power. Believe me, they left that courtroom with a very different view of what their role was in our society. And my client, for the first time in his life, felt that he had power, that he could call upon those who violated his rights to account. President Obama came into office as the President of the United States. And he was asked, what about those people in the Bush administration and who worked in concert with people in the Bush administration who committed countless felonies, federal felonies, in engaging in a blatantly illegal campaign of warrantless electronic surveillance of American citizens' communications. What about members of that prior administration and those who worked in concert with them, who kidnapped, disappeared, and tortured people or who sent them off elsewhere to be tortured? And his response was not the rule of law controls in this country, those who have violated it regardless of their station, regardless of their wealth, their power, they will be held to account. He said, for his own political purposes, for his own political agenda, let's just forget about it. Let's just move forward and not look backwards. Go out and try to Go out and steal a loaf of bread and try that defense on your judge and jury. What a message from the President of the United States. But it was, it was predictable because as a United States Senator, before he won the Democratic nomination, he had promised that he would join in a filibuster, that he would join in blocking proposed legislation that would grant telecommunication companies immunity for their federal felonies in cooperating in the illegal surveillance on American citizens. They threw millions and millions of dollars in lobbying. In three months alone, three telecom companies spent $12 million on their lobbyists. And it was a good investment. Because even then Senator Obama, after he won the Democratic nomination, betrayed that promise, turned 180 degrees, and voted for that immunity. Because they had the wealth and because they had the power. That's what controls in this country. It's called a plutocracy government by the wealthy. And it's, an, it's even more dangerous in this nation. Instead of those with the wealth being in those positions of control where we can see them, they're behind the veil. We have the pretense of a democracy. We have elections. But the campaigns are bought and paid for by the wealthy. The end result is controlled by the wealthy. But there's this pretense of a democracy. And then when these people are elected, who calls the shots? We know all you have to do is follow the money. Why do we have such a perverse health care system that benefits only the for-profit insurance companies? It's because of the corrupting influence of money from the insurance and the pharmaceutical industries. We all know it. 
Republicans, Democrats, Greens, Independents, Libertarians, Justice Party members, we all know that's how it works. We know that that's how it works with the military budget, with the arms manufacturers. We know that's how it works with the for-profit colleges, most of which are owned, by the way, by the likes of Goldman Sachs. Do you ever wonder? Now, how is it that student tuition loans are non-dischargeable in bankruptcy? How did that one ever get through the United States Congress? And then, President Obama said during his campaign, four years ago, he said, you can't expect to get a different result if you have the same people in these positions of power. So what does he do? After the economic meltdown in 2008, he brings the same people in as his top economic advisors and officials as fought for the deregulation who brought about the crisis in the first place. And crisis is not too strong a word. We're still reeling from that economic meltdown and people around the world are still reeling from the consequences of deregulation and massive fraud. President Obama received more money in the last campaign than any candidate in the history of this country. Again, they're getting a great return on their investment. Not one major player on Wall Street responsible for the massive fraud that helped lead to that economic meltdown has been held criminally accountable. I mean, really, these folks take loans, these packages of mortgages, of people who have little or no credit rating, with, with no real collateral or collateral that's way under what's represented, and they package them together, and then they chop them up, and they put them into these security instruments called derivatives, and they get the rating companies to rate them as triple A securities, that is, little or no risk securities, and then they're sold to pension plans. They're sold to insurance companies. And then when it all falls apart, and after companies like AIG has sold insurance, promising to cover any of the losses, but without having any reserves, to pay for those promises, they are all bailed out by the United States government because they're too big to fail. And to this day, and certainly there were arguments that, yeah, if they, if they hadn't been bailed out, I mean, it would have been nice if they put conditions on the bailout money so that they would be extending credit to the American people and helping our economy, but Congress apparently didn't have time for that. But what's really astounding is to this day, there are still these two big to fail banks. They have to be broken up or each and every day, we're facing the same risk of economic disaster we experienced in 2008. And by the way, this isn't just us saying this, the Dallas branch of the Federal Reserve just issued a report saying the same thing. They've got to be broken up. And what is it about this administration that they don't understand when they're putting the American people and, and millions of people around the world still at such tremendous risk of economic disaster when this happens again? So I want to get back to why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because the changes that we need to see made in this country will never, ever come about as long as it's the Democratic or Republican duopoly that's in 
control. They're in it together. They've helped create the situation together. They thrive from it together. They can't get along. They can't raise the money in this perverse, corrupt game that they've created without continuing the status quo. And it's just going to continue to get worse. So I say, Dorothy talked about, uh, in her remarks, this spoiler argument. The, the voting for the lesser of two evils. Well, I have three things to say about that. First of all, if we let that argument trump making the choice for real change, getting the corrupting influence of money out of government, supporting candidates who are calling for public financing of campaigns, a reversal of the Citizens United case, even if it takes a constitutional amendment to do it, ending the whole notion of corporate personhood under the Constitution. If we let that argument about we, can't, we don't want the greater of two evils to prevail over the lesser of two evils, so therefore we're not gonna vote for somebody else, we're not gonna choose a third way, then we are guaranteeing a continuation of the status quo. Let us not be driven by this fear-based approach anymore. Let's take an affirmative stand and say, however we can do it, that we're going to demonstrate at the polls and outside the electoral system that we're not gonna put up with it anymore and they will never again have our support because they've had it for far too long and they have betrayed us in every way possible. The second response to the spoiler argument is that President Obama isn't perhaps the lesser of two evils, he's most certainly the more effective of two evils. Think about it. The Democratic Party would not have just lined up along with the Republicans and allowed a Republican president to target U.S. citizens for assassination. Wouldn't have happened. They're, they're too great a political opportunists, if nothing else. There would have been an opposition party as things stand now. When we see these gross violations of human and civil rights, there is no major political force standing up against them. He's able to neutralize them because he's one of them. George Bush never would have gotten away with signing off on legislation, the NDAA, allowing the indefinite detention, and think about what indefinite detention means. It's not that police officers come by and politically arrest you and explain to your family where you're going and let you have your one phone call to your lawyer and, and take you in for charges to be filed in the trial. This allows, in the middle of the night, you to be awakened by agents of the federal government, whisked away to a military prison incommunicado, your family may never know whatever happened to you, and you're held, no lawyer, no legal assistance whatsoever, no right of habeas corpus, meaning there's no tribunal before whom you can go to argue that you're being held illegally, no charges and no trial. Couldn't have happened had it not been a Democratic president. It never would have happened under George Bush because there would have been major opposition, and yet it's been neutralized. We can't allow this to go on any longer in the United States of America. And that comes to my third point. Where do we draw the line? as citizens who value the fundamentals of our Constitution, who value the great traditions of our government, and as moral actors. Where do we draw that line? Will we draw the line 
uh, ramped up wars when we were promised four years ago that he would immediately bring them to an end, and he ends up sending so many more troops over to Afghanistan, and without any explanation, I've yet to hear a rationale for what we're doing there while we're creating so many more enemies, while we've got drones that have taken out between four and 800 shouldn't say taken out, That's, that anesthetizes as to what's happening. Brutally killing between four and 800 innocent civilians, 175 of whom are children. Do we draw the line there? Yes. Do we draw the line at indefinite detention? Do we draw the line at US citizens being targeted for assassination? And by the way, Anwar al-Awlaki, who was a U.S. citizen from New Mexico, killed by an unmanned drone. Within two weeks, his 16-year-old son, also a U.S. citizen, killed by an unmanned drone. Hardly made any of the mainstream media in this country. Talk to your friends, other than your socially and politically aware friends that you probably hang out with. That's why you're here tonight, rather than them, I guess. But Ask people on the street, do they know that this is happening for the first time in our nation's history as a matter of official policy? We have to be able to draw the line somewhere. Think about it. Would anybody that considers himself a good, loyal citizen, a moral being, would they have said five years? years ago that they would ever support for President of the United States someone who has done what this president has done, who would, who would set up a military unit, NORCOM, to be over North America, including to provide policing of American citizens for the first time since the Posse Comitatus Act in the late 1800s, who would declare a state of emergency. Did you know that we're living under a state of emergency, by the way? With a military unit over North America, with the power of the president to indefinitely detain, with the power of the president to target US citizens for assassination. And now by executive order, just a few weeks ago, the president has claimed the power to control, to take over all United States commerce in any factories, in any area of our commerce. Notwithstanding the steel seizure case under Truman, when Truman tried to take over the steel factories, the United States Supreme Court said, now you can't do that. But this president assumes the power just as George Bush would have assumed the power It spells authoritarianism. We are in the midst of a rapid track toward authoritarianism. An imperial presidency that has been ramped up unbelievably under this president. We have to draw the line. Even if it doesn't mean that your candidate is going to win this election, you're sending your own signal that you're not gonna put up with this anymore, that we're not gonna stand for it, that we will always fight and stand for the United States as we know it and the Constitution as we've known it from the very founding of this country. Let us not allow the transformation of our nation into what it has been becoming. Let us tell our young people, you're going to see the same country that we grew up in and one in which, yes, mistakes will be made, but where we will always aspire to those higher values. Now, you think about the church committee. And there was also a, a house committee, and President Ford even appointed the Rockefeller Commission when there were was information about abuses by our intelligence community, especially the FBI and the CIA. Well, it was an amazing period of time in our democracy. Yeah, they found out about abuses, but they undertook to discover what they were, get the details, and then disclose them to the people of this country. 
so that we could do what we could to make certain that they didn't happen again. That's the only way we know that the CIA tried to hire the mob to assassinate Castro. It's the only way we know that the FBI tried to blackmail Martin Luther King Jr. into committing suicide because they went out and engaged in illegal surveillance of his personal life and then sent him tapes warning him that there was only one way out for him. And there was a lot more. The CIA engaging in a wholesale campaign, opening mail without any warrants, opening mail of US citizens, and reading through that correspondence. Yeah, it happened. But we had statesmen and stateswomen who said, that can't happen in the United States without accountability without us discovering what happened and disclosing it, and then doing what we could to make certain that it doesn't happen again in the future. And now what do we see from our government? From the president on down, let's sweep it all under the rug. Those photo, there are photographs, more photographs of torture. Let's not disclose them. It might make people mad. Instances of illegal surveillance, of torture, Let's look forward, not backward. Just sweep it under the rug. We don't even want an investigation. Congress has completely failed to live up to its constitutional responsibility to determine whether there have been these abuses of power in the executive branch. They've been so derelict under, their con under the Constitution that the president sends our armed forces over to Libya without even bothering, no, not even a pretense of constitutional authorization in blatant violation of the war power clause of the Constitution. So what does Congress do? It was put to them, well, are you going to authorize it or not? They get together and they said, well, we'll authorize the funding for it, but we're not going to say whether we authorize the use of military forces in Libya. You know, there hasn't been a declaration of war. Congress has not made the determination itself as to whether this nation should go to war since World War II. Either they don't take any action, or as with the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and the authorization to use force against Iraq, they say, we'll leave it for the president to decide. Completely unconstitutional delegation of the sole prerogative of Congress, probably the most important power provided under the Constitution. And they leave it to one person. There couldn't be a more dangerous situation facing our nation. So you combine this now with a situation where we have the greatest disparity in wealth and income since the 1920s, since before the Great Depression, with the top 1% holding more than 40% of the personal wealth in this country and 22% of our children living in poverty. And this administration and Congress being the lapdogs of Wall Street still. This elite aristocracy financial aristocracy, and an elite that seems to be immune from accountability under the law. And then there are the rest of us. But the rest of us can make the difference. We can't any longer use the excuse of Citizens United or this corrupt finance system in our, in our campaigns. There are no excuses because we can organize we can pull people together at the grassroots and get them involved. And for those who say, I'm not going to vote because I don't believe in the electoral system, let me say, you are part of the problem. Young people who didn't vote in the last election, the midterm election, are responsible largely for the composition of Congress because they came out and voted for Obama. Then they got discouraged and they stayed home. But it's all of us. We have all got to do everything that we can. 
and gain inspiration from the Arab uprisings. The people in Egypt didn't say, ah, oh, it's been this way forever, it's never gonna change. The people in Tunisia, they didn't say, ah, oh, you know, it's dangerous or I don't have time for it. I've got some more football or basketball to watch. The people in Libya standing up against this brutal dictator, no, they came together, they organized, and they said, we're not going to let up. There's too much at stake. It's not only us, it's our children, it's later generations. It's who we are as a people. And so they organized. They used the democratically beautiful means of communication that social media provides, that we have. If they could do it, we can do it in this nation. We can call for major radical changes, the kinds of changes that our founders were seeking for our nation, the kinds of liberties that so many have fought and died for, given so much to leave for later generations. So now it's our job. People have been fighting for these values from the beginning of our nation up until the last 12 years. Now it's up to us. Ben Franklin, this might be an apocryphal story, but it makes a very good point. He was leaving the Constitutional Convention. A woman came up to him and she said, well, doctor, what do we have, a monarchy or a republic? He said, well, ma'am, a republic, if you can keep it. Keeping and maintaining our republic is the job of every generation. We have a tremendous challenge facing us, but if we fail in our responsibility and our opportunity, then it's very unlikely that later generations are going to enjoy the same kinds of liberties and promises the freedom, the equal opportunity, the security, and the sense of compassion that have been the values driving this nation from the very outset. So let's rise to that occasion. Let's embrace that opportunity. Let's live up to our responsibilities and do everything we can to organize everybody together across the political spectrum and turn this nation around. Thank you very much. Thank you. My only reason is my friends know that I have considered voting for Obama this time is because the president nominates Supreme Court justices. Frankly, I hear it from some very close friends, people that I have tremendous regard for, and uh, it's a consideration that kept me from doing this for a very long time until I realized if we accept that argument, we'll never see real change in this country. We, we are simply locking in the status quo and this corrupt system that we have. And if anybody thinks the Democrats have done a good job with Supreme Court appointments, 96 to zero, and I think it was 96 or it might have been 98, in the United States Senate for Scalia. Every single Democrat, Alito, Roberts, Clarence Thomas, Kennedy, the Democrats all let them by. They could have stopped any one or all of them. They didn't do their job. And I, I, I wanna see a different Supreme Court too, but in the scheme of things, changing the system sending the message, we're not going to put up with this anymore. I mean, the damage that Wall Street has done to this nation, the criminality that's taken place, the deregulation by both the Republicans and the Democrats of the financial industry, I think that's impacting you and everybody else in this room a whole lot more than whatever some future Supreme Court nomination is going to do. And we need to set the ship of state right and taking things in a very different direction, Republicans and Democrats, is the only way we're going to do that. Thank you. Thank you. How do you see uh, 
getting rid of uh, the prohibition on medical marijuana, I mean, marijuana and hemp? Thanks for the question. Um, uh, first of all, the laws against industrial hemp are absolutely insane. I've got, I've got a special provision on that alone on my website because I think that's so bizarre in terms of our economy. And, you know, actually people can grow it elsewhere and then ship it to this country and then it can be utilized here. And all that does is undermine those who would grow it in the United States. But uh, to answer the larger question, uh, for a long time, I've been an advocate of ending prohibition generally as to drugs. Le regulate them, tax them, treat substance abuse, whether it's illicit drugs, over-the-counter drugs, prescription drugs, alcohol, tobacco. Let's treat them as the public health issue that they are and get it out of the criminal justice system. And by the way, um, th there was a really great, uh, I think it was a cover story actually in uh, Rolling Stone three or four months ago. Uh, President Obama's attorney general had said about medical marijuana that they weren't interested in spending any resources in enforcing federal laws as to medical marijuana if they conflicted with state laws. They were basically saying, we're going to decide not to prosecute these cases if states have decided that medical marijuana is okay. And then, once again, they turned 180 degrees. They put a person, a former Bush person, in charge. And now that these people were set up by those promises and they've invested all this money, now they're being busted left and right by the Obama administration. Just another betrayed promise and it makes absolutely no sense and I, I think it's tragic on a lot of fronts misprioritization of resources betrayal of promises but also the 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 the, the beneficial effects that have been found from medical marijuana people in a lot of pain where that sometimes is the only thing that grants them the relief Talked to somebody the other day, it's the only way she said she's been able to find to get past her migraine headaches. Cancer patients, why would we do this as a nation? It makes absolutely no sense. If we put a fraction of the money into good, and by the way, I killed the D.A.R.E. program right after I became mayor of Salt Lake City. And I know there are a lot of those parents who like the t-shirts and the bumper stickers and all that. But if you look uniformly at the peer-reviewed published research that's been done, there's not one study that shows that it's effective, given all the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been spent, not one study that shows that it's effective in reducing drug abuse over the long term, and some studies have shown that it's actually counterproductive, that the graduates of the DARE program end up abusing drugs more than those who don't. My son told me, that's how he learned how to roll a joint, was in his D.A.R.E. program. What is your take on the privatization of our criminal system, our prison system, and the privatization of our educational? Uh, our prison industrial complex in this country is an obscenity. Uh, these companies, by the way, uh, as hard to believe as this is, they actually spend money lobbying for sentence enhancements so that they have a larger market, so that they keep more people in the prison so that they can make more money. Um, as to privatization of education, I wasn't aware until probably a year or so ago as to who owns these private colleges. 47, you, you heard about Olympia snow stepping down? Look into it. It wasn't because it's too hostile in Congress. It's always been hostile in Congress. Uh, her husband was in the midst of this uh, scandal involving the company that owns University of Phoenix, uh, which is 47% owned by Goldman Sachs. Their recruiting practices have been absolutely despicable. And think about it. The students are charged these huge tuitions. 
They're non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. Non-dischargeability in bankruptcy used to be reserved for the most extreme kinds of cases like fraud or uh, child support. But now young people trying to get an education, they, they get these, they undertake this huge indebtedness and in too many instances, it's guaranteed by the United States government. So when I referred earlier to the corrupting influence of, of money uh, in our government and for-profit colleges, recently Congress was trying to reform what was going on and restrict the government guarantees for colleges that were putting out students who weren't getting jobs and who weren't equipped. And these colleges and the investment banks that own them put on the lobbying blitz. They went out and got mostly democratic lobbyists, many of them people who have gone through the revolving door from Congress to these lobbying firms. Uh, Dick Gephardt was the primary lobbyist that led this movement and they went in and they watered down that legislation to the point it was almost meaningless. Again, costing the American people hundreds of millions of dollars and all of them going to bat for these for-profit colleges and the investment firms that own them. It's a horribly abusive situation. Sometime just Google Goldman Sachs for-profit colleges and the stories there, the abuses, what they do to recruit these young people and get them stuck with this debt, it's absolutely shameful. And then we end up as taxpayers being on the hook. I've talked to some of these students, I'm sure you all know some, maybe, maybe some of you are in the audience, but when you hear a woman telling you with tears in her eyes that she will never be able to own a home, she'll never get a mortgage because of her student loan that continues to accrue interest, that she'll never be able to contribute toward her own daughter's tuition because of the burden that she's still carrying, you know that this needs to get turned around and very quickly. And by the way, I am in favor of making the same kind of commitment for free and equal opportunity higher education as we made for all of our children for secondary education many generations ago.